How you doing? I'm pro saxophonist Jamie Anderson and you're watching Get Your Sax Together. We're going to have a really simple, pragmatic lesson this week. No guff. I'm going to teach you how to learn any standard in 10 steps and you are going to be so good at playing the tune by the end of it. And not only that, you're going to be a much better improviser and a much better musician and you're going to have a lot more knowledge about jazz. Sounds good, right? Let's hit it. Here's step one. For step one, it's quite simple. You are going to learn the melody of your song. Now, this process can apply to anything that you're learning, but of course, I'm sort of specifically thinking about jazz standards at this point in time, but it'll work for any song. If it's a jazz tune without lyrics, obviously, you, there's no lyrics to learn. But in the case of a standard, you might want to learn the lyrics as well. It'll give you a sort of vibe for the song and it'll give you a vibe for the phrasing. Now, I'm not the guy who's like, you must know the lyrics to play the song. Uh, however, I do, I do fully understand that it's a useful process. So first step is to learn the melody. Now, as you can see, we're going to look at a tune called It Could Happen To You today, just as an example. But remember, it applies to anything. You're going to learn the melody. Now, the melody is probably going to be notated very simply, or the best thing you can do is actually learn it by ear from a simple version. So let's have a little go through the melody. And remember, if you learn the lyrics, that can really help you out sometimes as well. Okay, here's step one. Here's the melody. There we go. That is covering the melody. Now, as you can see, I've taken a little bit of license and added, um, you know, a little bit of variation to the rhythm. Because if you play it like the original sheet music, oh my God, it's going to be far too straight. Now, get that melody in your head and let's move on to step two. Okay, step two is the deep dive into the song. You're going to explore this song, get to grips with all the different versions so that you're not missing out something really, really important. So, first of all, you try and find the original recording and work out who wrote it. Now, It Could Happen To You is written by Jimmy Van Heusen with lyrics by Johnny Burke. And uh, it was first featured in um, 1944 in a film called And The Angels Sing. And it was sung by Dorothy Lamour. And it sounded like this. Hide your heart from smiling. Lock your dreams at night. It could happen to you. It could. Early important versions of It Could Happen to You were by Joe Stafford. This was the first commercial recording. Then there was uh, a version by a famous version by Bing Crosby that sounded like this. Hide your heart from sight. Lock your dreams at night. Now, quite often with these really old-fashioned versions, they're kind of all chromatic and strings and lush arrangements. And it's actually quite difficult to hear what the chords are because of all the fancy arrangement and sort of twirls and stuff that goes on top. So it might be later when you get into the jazz musicians that you can actually hear the chords. Now, one really great version of it could happen to you is by Chet Baker. Sounds like this. Hide your heart from sight. Lock your dreams at night. And there's another very famous version by Miles Davis. Sounds like this. John Coltrane's in that one. That's a really famous version with the Harmon Mew. That's probably one of the most famous jazz versions, actually. Uh, there's also notable versions by Frank Sinatra. Hide your heart from sight. Sarah Vaughan. Hide your heart from sight. Doris Day. Hide your heart from sight. More recently, Diane Crow. Hide your heart from sight. 
Sonny Stitt. Big favourite of mine. Uh, finally, Anita O'Day. Hide your heart from sight. Lock your dreams at night. And of course, there are innumerable other versions, including by uh, Keith Jarrett and, you know, so many other people. So check out all the versions and you can see the little list I've put together. The original version, the composure, the composer. Get yourself the uh, original published sheet music to see if the changes are, are any different. Get yourself on Wikipedia. See um, who the famous versions are recorded by. Learn the history of the song. See if there's any notable live versions. What key do people play it in? What tempo do people play it in? As you can see, a lot of those singers did it as a ballad, but the jazzers are more like doing it as a medium tempo thing. In fact, Sonny Rollins does it completely unaccompanied. That's a really cool version. Are there alternate chords? You might have iReal Pro, but don't trust iReal Pro. Like, listen to the different versions and see if there are well-known uh, different chords that are in there. For example, if you study the original version, when you get to the sixth bar, there's actually a chord four and then a four minor instead of the chords which are in iReal Pro, and it sounds like this. So you've got the whole first part of the tune that you know. But then the next part, the jazzers go like this. But on the original um, recording from the film and the first two versions, it actually goes like this, chord four, and then four minor six. Which is actually quite beautiful. There's not that jazzy backdoor dominance. So these are the little things, the little tips that you can pick up when you check out all the different versions. And finally, for the deep dive, are there any uh, very famous arrangement features like famous intros, famous outros, uh, riffs and stuff that happen in the middle? For example, if you play all the things you are, Charlie Parker did a very famous introduction. So it's definitely worth knowing that because these are the sort of things that people might play if you're trying to do your tune in a jam session. Knowledge is power. Okay, well, let's move on to the third step now. Now, I have put together a special cheat sheet for It Could Happen To You, but this is a process you can use for all the songs that you want to learn. It is um, a free download that you can get. Just put your email in and you'll get it. I spent ages on this. It's absolutely awesome. There's B-flat parts and there's E-flat parts and there's all the sheet music which I've been going through for all of the 10 steps. So go down there, click the link in the description and get your free PDF. Step three, very simple. You're going to learn and memorize the root movement for the chords in the song. You've learned the melody. Now you're going to learn the bass movement and really get it in your head for it could happen to you. It sounds like this. And once you've got that root movement really in your brain, it's worth uh, playing around with the roots and playing them in different rhythms and also interspersing the roots with notes of the melody. But we're also gonna do that at a later step. Okay, let's move on to the fourth part. Part four, you're gonna take the simplest elements of the harmony and you're just gonna play the triads. No seventh chords yet. <laughs> Spoiler, you know what's coming up. But for the moment, we're gonna play triads. You're gonna reduce your song to the very bare bones, just the three notes of each triad, and you're gonna play it through. You're gonna arpeggio each chord as they come up. Let's give that a go. And once you've really got to grips with those triads in the very basic form, you're gonna start improvising only using the notes of the triads and so keep it really simple. It's gonna sound something like this for this particular song.
So nice and simple, and I'm sure you know where this is going now with step five. Let's go for the seventh chords. Okay, for the fifth step, we're gonna build on what we've already accomplished with the triads and the roots and the melody. And now we're gonna arpeggiate the seventh chords of your song. And then we're gonna improvise just using the notes of the seventh chords, those chord tones. So uh, this is what it sounds like for It Could Happen To You. You can keep it quite loose the way the, you arpeggiate it. It doesn't really matter what octave you play it in or which rhythm, just make sure you really dial in those notes. It should sound something like this. And then have a go at improvising just using those chord tones. Now, you know, slow it all down a lot more. I'm just kind of moving through this rapidly for YouTube. But this is the kind of thing that you can do just using the chord tones for that song. Now, admittedly, that wasn't my greatest chord tone solo of all, of all time, but whatever, we're just kind of smashing through this at the moment. Now, the next important step is to stop being so vertical as we've been so far and get the horizontal element of how to improvise horizontally through the song, how to create melodies. This is the really vital step. This is step six. Let's check it out. So really hope you're enjoying seeing how this process unfolds, learning your songs. If you want to learn a whole bunch of other really cool stuff about playing saxophone, go and check out my Saxophone Success Masterclass. There's a whole load of really cool stuff in there which can instantly transform your practice and how good you sound on saxophone. Just click the link in the description. It's completely free. Help yourself. And on that note, let's get back to this process of learning how to play any song. Okay, step six is really important. This is where we take all those vertical choppy chords that don't really sound like music, and we look for those lovely horizontal lines that move through them. They're called the guide tone lines. Now, the guide tones are the, the most important guide tones are the thirds and sevenths. The guide tones are gonna to fall through the chord sequence in, uh, you're gonna take the third of one chord, then the seventh and the next, usually, depending on the chord. And you can see those thirds and sevenths in red on the bottom stave there on the PDF. You can also see the fifths and the ninths. Now, the fifth can be substituted for the thirteenth, and the ninth can be substituted for the root. But you'll see those two strata of guide tone lines, the red thirds and sevenths and the green fifths and ninths. These are lines that when you get to the bar line, you want to change from like the third to the seventh or the, or the seventh to the third to really make it sound like you're making the chords and to find these beautiful lines that move through the changes. In the top stave, I've also put a few common tones which are gonna be the same through the chords, which are really nice. And you can kind of use them as anchors to hinge off, which is a really great way of improvising. Now, if I just play straight through the chords with the notes that you can see on screen, I know it's played from Sibelius, so it's pretty rubbish, but the harmony is already really full. It sounds like this. Okay, so you can see that there's some really nice lines which are making their way through the chords. So you need to become familiar with these chord tone lines and you can start improvising by uh, using the chord tones but focusing on one of those lines. So for example, if I just focus on the top green line just for this version and I use the rest of the chord tones to fill it in, it could sound something like this.
So you can see that I was using that very top green um, guy tone line and I was hanging other chord tones off it to create this melody. Now, when you're improvising, you're not going to do it as, you know, as an exercise like that. But it's nice to know those lines. You know, you might have the B of the E minor 7 going to the B flat on the A7 flat 9 going to the A of the D minor 7. And more importantly, you should spend a lot of time playing the red thirds and sevenths so that when you get to that bar line, you can change from the, the thirds to the sevenths and it's really going to sound like you're making the changes. And of course, the other thing you can do is take those common tones and hang a line off those common tones using the guide tones which are changing beneath it. So this time I'm going to take uh, a couple of the top uh, from the top stave, which are the common tones, and then change the chord tones underneath them. And you'll see that you can kind of hinge stuff off the bottom of it. It sounds pretty cool. This is what it's going to sound like. Now, obviously, in real life, you're not going to be doing it half as contrived as that, but you can see how these uh, these held common tones, which sound really good through each chord, can really help you improvise and get to know the tune really well. Okay, let's move on now to step seven. So we've done the roots, we've done the triads, we've done the seventh chords, we've done the notes which, which uh, smoothly flow between all those chords in the guide tones and common tones. But now we're going to fill in the gaps and get to grips with the scales which accompany these chords. And then that's going to give us all the tools that we need to weave all this stuff together. So let's smash through the scales here. I don't have time to explain what all the scales are right now. That's all going to be in Improvisation Mastery. It's too, too long for YouTube. But here's what the scales sound like over It Could Happen To You. There's the scales. Now, there's no point in just running up and down scales. That's pretty boring. So let's look at step eight now. So step eight is where we're going to marry together the scales and the chord tones. The chord tones are going to give you that real sense of harmony where you are. The scales are going to link it up and make it sound a bit more melodic. And I call this chord scale combos. Now, you're going to make up a series of patterns for yourself. The particular one I've used in this example is you're just going to go one, two, three, four, five of the chord. And then uh, the second half is five, seven, five, three. So it sounds, the pattern sounds like this. And for each chord, you're going to duplicate that pattern. One, two, three, four, five up the scale. And then the second half is five, seven, five, three. So the chord tones. Now, when you put it together and you map it out over all the changes, it's going to sound like this. So, <laughs> nowhere to take breaths, which uh, gives you a bit of a problem. But remember, these are just exercises, okay? Don't stress out too much about, you know, we're not performing. This isn't going out to the public. What we're going to try and do here, the, the point of step eight is to join up your scales and your chords so that you really get to know how the scales and the chords interact, how you can play melodically and still make the chords, um, you know, still make the changes using the chord tones and your guide tones. It's just more ammunition so that you can start to play more fluently over your particular tune. Let's move on now to, we're almost there, let's move on now to step nine. Okay, step nine is really cool. What we're going to do is you're going to play parts of the melody and parts of the harmony. This is tying in the melody with the harmony. 
so that you can really play the important parts of the harmony, which really spell it out and still stick to the melody. Now, if you play this on your own solo, everybody should be able to hear the harmony of the tune underneath the melody. So let's have a little go at this on It Could Happen To You. Remember, you're filling in the harmonic gaps in between little segments of the tune. So we're taking little important fragments of the harmony, especially the guide tones, and trying to weave them into the melody. All right, the moment has come. Step 10, the final step for you to learn your song inside out. Okay, fanfare of trumpets. It's time for step 10, the final step, which is, you know, time to improvise and get on with it. So you're really going to start blowing freely over this tune using all the tools that you've learned and all the knowledge that you've that you've accumulated. Now, as well as just blowing freely on the chords, what you really need to do is start to write etudes over the chords so that you can improvise in very slow motion and write some really cool stuff. And probably more important than anything else, you need to transcribe some solo. So if this is me learning... Um, uh, it could happen to you. I would go to the Sonny Stitt version because he is so great at outlining the chords. I would transcribe his solo and study it and see what scales he's playing, what arpeggios, what passing notes, how he makes the harmony, what chords he's using. And then I would go back and try and integrate all that into my own playing. I would call the tune on my own gigs. I would call the tune at jam sessions. I would just keep trying to play that tune. <laughs> I'd put it out in social media. I would really immerse myself in if it could happen to you. So maybe the final version would look a little something like this. Okay, my friends, that is all we got time for. Quite a deep dive lesson. Don't say you don't get good value in this channel. Once again, remember you can get your PDF using the link there. You can get your free masterclass using the link there. All these links are in the description anyway. If you've bought me a coffee, you are an absolute hero. Thank you so much. If you want to buy me a coffee, then you can use the link in the description. You don't have to. Perfectly happy giving it all away for free. Don't you worry. This stuff is all covered in much more detail, exhaustive and step-by-step, -step, easily manageable detail in my improvisation mastery course. I might just stick a link down there so that you can get that, uh, although it's not usually for sale. So <laughs> go, go, uh, maybe this week I'll keep it open or something so you can really go through these steps using improvisation mastery. And uh, until next week, make sure that you practice hard Practice super smart and enjoy your music. Take it easy, guys. <sighs> Get it right. And once you've got that rude move, that rude movement completely effed it up. <laughs> <laughs>